ladies and gentlemen, Nelson. Here she comes, just like an angel. Seems like forever that she's been on my mind, but nothing has changed. She thinks I'm a waste of her time. We've toured a bunch, uh, obviously, over the last 30 years with uh, different projects. One, namely, uh, called Ricky Nelson Remembered, and it's a retrospective on our father, and we also do a Christmas show. We've done that. But we, we had mothballed Nelson until the point in time where we felt we could put it back together again the right and proper way. We didn't want to phone it in. We wanted it to be, like, the real deal. And uh, so it's been 30 years since we brought Nelson properly back to town. Wow. And I saw in the notes that – you actually opened the 1990 tour here in St. Louis? We did. We did. Uh, this has always been a band that the Midwest has truly gotten. Okay. And uh, yeah, we, we sold millions of records to a bunch of kids back in the day who had no idea who my parents or grandparents were. <laughs> and uh, we did it all in the Midwest in a three-state area. So wow. Missouri was a big deal for us. Now, was that the same <laughs> tour with Cinderella? Yeah, well, that was part of it. You know, we went out and headlined first. Okay. So we, we actually had done a full year on our own in theaters. Okay. And, and then we kind of got sidetracked going out with Cinderella uh, when they were on their Heartbreak Station tour. And uh, we did that for, for a short while. I think it was like two months we were out with those guys and we hated it. And then we went back out on our own again. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Well, um, when thinking back, was there a particular moment in your life when you knew that you – we're going to be a musician for, for a living? Sure. Yeah, yeah. It was, I was actually two years old, mm -hmm. and I was sitting on an apple crate on the side of a stage watching my father perform at Knott's Berry Farm in Orange County, California. Wow. It was, it was actually the earliest memory that I can remember. I brought it up to my mom when she was still alive, and I thought mm -hmm. I was like five at the time. And she goes – she got wide-eyed. She goes, no, you were two. I, I remember that concert. You only went one time. You were two years old. Wow, And that was when I made the connection, and I, I saw my dad up there in front of a sold-out crowd having a great time. He was having a great time. They were having a great time, um, and I went, that's what I want to do. And wow. so, I mean, look, we, we got our first instruments when uh, I was five years old, mm -hmm. uh, did our first recording session at 11, started playing the L.A. clubs professionally at 12, and got our first record deal at 19 with Geffen and our first number one at 22. When when you talk about playing the L.A. clubs, what was that like at such a young age to play, uh, you know, those those type of venues? Well, the, the irony here is that people always identify us with that whole Sunset Strip scene mm -hmm. that was happening, you know, during the Van Halen, Rat Poison, you know, uh, later on Warrant years. Right. And uh, Matt and I had been playing the L.A. clubs a full decade sooner than that whole thing happened. You know, when, when we started, it was like the late 70s. And uh, bands, uh, the, the L.A. club scene was so different back then because it was really kind of like the Sharks versus the Jets. You had the mm -hmm. original first class of punk rockers. We're talking like uh, X, the Dead Kennedys, uh, Black Flag, all that mm -hmm. stuff. So you had your punkers, sure. the Circle Jerks and all that stuff. And then you had your pop guys, so um, the new wave guys. So you had like all the bands with the the in front of their names. So you had like uh, the Knack, the Go-Go's, the Bangles. You know, all of those bands. And and our first thing was a band called The Strange Agents that we put together as 12-year-olds. Um, we actually um, petitioned City Hall there in Los Angeles to allow us to be escorted in by someone who was over 21 as long as we performed and immediately got escorted out after we played. And that's what we did. And from 12 to uh, 18, we were we were fighting it out and holding our own with all of those bands as uh, as kids against people who are twice our age and wow. i'm really grateful for the, that era for that time because you know people always would complain about or, or, or brag about oh it was so tough man when you're out there and you're playing at the clubs and you're you're going against the poisons of the world and the warrants of the world it's like yeah you think that's tough why don't you try actually trying to share the stage and fight for your own slot against bands who are doing jangle pop who just shot up heroin in the bathroom right before they got here and knifed their girlfriends last week. That's what Matt and I grew up with, you know, like right. dueling it out with people like that. And we needed to get that seasoned and that tough long before we met John Kalodner at Geffen, long before we got our record deal with Nelson, long before we put all that stuff together, the kind of dues that we paid 
I wouldn't take back for all the tea in China because it, we needed that. When Nelson hit, you know, there were there were a lot of people that loved us, don't get us wrong, but there were also a lot of haters that didn't understand us. Right. And it just it just helped us really navigate uh, those those turbulent waters. Going back to when After the Rain came out and it seemed like it was an instant success, how did that change things for you, I mean, professionally and even personally? Well, it was the world's longest overnight success. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, before anybody really saw us on MTV, we had done an entire year of going to sometimes three cities in a, in a day and working our way up the radio chain because the Millie Vanilli scandal had happened about a year before. Uh, people saw me and Matt come and they thought we were Millie Vanilla. They didn't think it was real. So the way for us to, we kind of came out of the box guilty until proven innocent. You know, there were all kinds of accusations of nepotism. Uh, you just see us. I mean, our image was striking to say the least. Right. And all of a sudden, there were a lot of people that didn't want to believe that it was real. So we had to go and prove from the very beginning that that it was real, that we were real writers and performers and singers and been doing it since we were babies. So we went to all the radio stations across the country, starting with the, the smallest ones out in the sticks. And we were do we did more the morning radio show with our acoustic guitars, singing live, doing our thing. And we put a whole year of that sweat equity into that before we even dropped our first MTV video. Wow. So by, by the time, um, what really broke us, to be honest, was our manager at the time also managed Cinderella. <laughs> and he had a connection with somebody over at MTV. And he had heard that Daisy Fuentes was going on vacation for a week. And so he talked to his friend. He said, hey, you know what? I've got this new band I'm working with. What, what do you, how about letting the Nelson twins come in and, and, uh, and do Daisy's gig for her for a week? And so we hosted Dial in TV uh, at the time and doing the countdown and, and all that stuff every day. And, you know, we were self-effacing, and we had our acoustics with us long before MTV Unplugged or doing that was cool. And, you know, again, trying to prime the pump that way. And then at the end of that first week, our first single dropped, which was Love and Affection, and uh, it went number one within three weeks, and uh, it sold out its first pressing that first day. But it was from that exposure on MTV, just being MTV hosts, that really did it. Speaking of MTV, that was one of my questions. Uh, actually, a couple questions about MTV. Um, I've talked to a lot of musicians, and they tell me, you know, making music videos was one of the worst experiences they've ever had. <laughs> they just didn't enjoy it. How was that for, for you guys back then? Are you kidding me? Look, this was a band that was made for MTV. <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously. I mean, I, anybody that would complain about it didn't have any vision. Because if you really were to look at it, I mean, it, look at the Nelson videos, especially the ones for for uh, After the Rain and for Love and Affection, mm-hmm. when when really no one at the record company gave a shit about us, which they didn't. We, we, weren't, we were not the planned success on Geffen. Mm-hmm. They had a different priority band at the time. Um, the, the band that they were working on was a band called Little Caesar. Okay. And David Geffen had just started a, an offshoot label called DGC. And we were the, the first two bands that he, he ported over from Geffen proper to DGC. Mm-hmm. But their priority band for the quarter was Little Caesar, which unfortunately laid an egg. Didn't happen. Again, it was that MTV thing that, that really propelled me and Matt. But what was really cool about you know, being a couple of guys that were flying under the radar, when no one cares about you at a label, you've got all this freedom to do what you want to do. It's not until you actually knock one out of the park that all of a sudden the executives start showing up going, you know, you need to write a song like this or you need to look like this in your video. Back then in the beginning, it was great. We had free reign, at least for those first two videos. Mm-hmm. And we looked at it at, as, you know, art. This was expression. You you had this great opportunity to do something flashy and catching. So we had totally embraced it. Our thing was like, look, I know as a music fan or an MTV fan, when I've just got this going on in the background, I'm getting ready for my weekend, whatever, I got uh, maybe a second or a second and a half on, on a particular channel for something to catch my eye enough for me to park it there and go, oh, what's this? And so from the very beginning, uh, the first video was Love and Affection. You know, everybody else was doing these really boring, like, black and white warehouse video, spilled beer on your girlfriend kind of things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, I dare say most of the musicians you talked to that hated making videos were making videos like that. Yeah. And that, it was unimaginative and, and, and a chore. For us, dude, everybody else was black and white. 
trying to be tough. Matthew and I were technicolor. We had birds flying backwards, snow falling up, jumping on trampolines. It was ridiculous what we did, but we made it with a certain thing in mind. Our whole thing was like, man, love us or hate us, you're going to know who we are, and we're going to get your attention. And that was what the goal was for those first two videos. And without those first two videos, there's no way in the world Nelson wouldn't have, would have sold millions of records like it did. That was going to be my next question because I was I was a kid nine ten years old, but I remember your the the cassette was one of the first I ever owned after the rain. One of the oh, first rocking, I ever man. owned. Awesome. Uh, okay. But but I loved MTV, um, and, and that's something that I still talk to my buddies about. And you know, I always like to ask musicians. Do you think the music industry would be different today if MTV were still doing videos and things like that? Yes, I absolutely do. And I wish it were that way. You know, because look, the the whole thing, uh, I don't know if you remember the way it was. Okay, when you were a kid, here's what they sold us on. Okay, when MTV came out, it was going to be all music, only music, 24 hours a day. That was yeah. their pitch. That was the commercial, right? Mm -hmm. the, their whole thing yeah. was, their commercial was no commercials, all music. Right. And they did a bait and switch on us. They did that for the first two years, and it was awesome. 24 hours a day, the only kind of like cut twos and froms were from the original VJs. That was it. No commercials, nothing. Okay, it was music, right? Maybe right. you got MTV News for a little blip for your trivia. That's it, right? Yeah. Yep. And then two years into it, they started eking in commercials. And it's right. like, you know, what the fuck does Clearasil have to do with my favorite videos? <laughs> yeah. and, okay, and then it went – game shows they started doing game shows then that that started making them some money then there was a writer's strike in hollywood and somebody came up with the bright idea of reality television we're going to do something called the, the the surreal life or something and then they you know then they did that and that and then all of a sudden it didn't even it didn't even resemble in any way the mtv that we all loved that was Absolutely. when you know it just turned into to content and programming, and it, and it was no longer art or music. And that's a shame because, I mean, look, I remember when, when I first saw MTV, the video was I loved. I remember I discovered Def Leppard for the first time when the video for Photograph came on. And mm -hmm. it was the first, first like, week of MTV. And it was like, oh, man, this is just brilliant. I love this song. It's amazing. And then there was another video I loved, and it was by a, a band called The Buggles. And they had a song called Fe Don't Fail Me Now with Todd Rundgren in it. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, shit, this is great. They're puppets. And I, I realized, <laughs> man, you can do anything you want to do when you're making a video. It doesn't just have to be a boring, hey, put a camera on a band that's playing. You can do yeah. all kinds of stuff. You can do concepts. And, and then I have to note here, uh, the Smithsonian gives Ozzy Nelson and Ricky Nelson credit as the inventors of the very first conceptual rock music video in history for the video our dad did for Traveling Man in oh, 1960. Wow. So Dude, it's been in our DNA for generations. Uh -huh. You know, this is just kind of what we've always done. And, and with MTV, it was like, oh, stand back. I'm going to write some concept videos. I'm going to, you know, spend way too much money doing these things. But these videos are immortal. I mean, granted, yeah. they got bloated and expensive. I mean, we spent a half a million dollars doing the After the Rain video that, you know, it took us 30 years to pay back. But I don't regret mm -hmm. a single minute of doing that spend. Wow. That's awesome. Um I was reading that you guys actually wrote the theme song for Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Is that right? Yeah, baby, man. Power tool. That was us. How how did that come to happen? And and, and one thing I was just wondering, because I just saw Kiana is going out on tour with Dogstar. Do you ever get to talk music with him at all? No, no. no I've actually never met the guy. Oh, and, man. And, and, and I would really like to, because I've heard like, I, you know, everybody says he's just a really cool dude. So right. um, I'd love to talk music with them. I, I really would. But, yeah, you know, we, we had a manager or a management team at the time. Um, these two guys had basically been massaging this deal that we were putting together with Geffen. This is when we, we had really targeted John Kolodner, the A&R guy at Geffen. Uh -huh. Back there in the day, that David was really a, a genius. Um, he had three superstar A&R guys in the building on sunset there they had their own separate wings and they all hated each other and it was really about competition it was like which a and r guy was going to have more of a success on each quarter so like okay you're john kolodner he was the guy that put acdc on the map at atco he put foreigner together and signed them 
uh, he, he had the storied career of doing that. At the time, he was doing White Snake on their big record, mm-hmm. uh, Peter Gabriel and Cher. And we thought, well, this guy's got a 20-year contract with Geffen. He's going nowhere. We need to develop Nelson, and it's going to take a year or two or three. But, but at all these other companies, let's say you, you had a good meeting with an A&R guy. Most of those guys, on their first failure, they were gone in a month. So mm-hmm. we wanted to go after John uh, Kalodner because we knew it was going to take a little bit of time to develop everything. And chances are we were going to get to, to go all the way to the prom with this one guy. And so we were in this, uh, in this phase where we were doing demos for him. And we'd been courting him for like a year, but he had still not pressed the go button yet. He still mm-hmm. hadn't said, I want to sign you to, you know, to me here at Geffen. And our managers were frustrated at the time. We were frustrated. We were writing songs, and uh, we had made a demo of, of a song called Two Heads Are Better Than One to impress Kalodner with, and we had co-written it with our friend Weasel Zappa, and, and we'd made it in John Boylan's basement studio, which was cool, on his, on his four-track reel-to-reel. And our managers somehow had a friend uh, at a and Records and they were putting together the soundtrack for this new movie called Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And they basically sent me the synopsis of the movie. And I got to tell you something. I, I, you can only imagine what that read like. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, I was just thinking to myself, there is no way in the world this, this thing's going to go straight to video. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I mean, you know, because it, it, it read even more stupid than it was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they said they, they really they're, – they're getting songs for this. They want uh, bands that are up and coming, and uh, they definitely want to be rock. And you know, we love this this thing that you just wrote last week, Two Eyes Are Better Than One. Um, Kalodner's still not popping on you guys, uh, but the, the, the company wants it. They want this to be the title track when they're rolling the credits. Would that be okay with you guys? It's like, well, yeah, hell yeah, because nothing else was going on. Right. Um, and so we did the deal, and, and, and it was going to be called Nelson. And when Kalodner caught wind that A&M was going to be doing the soundtrack record for Bill and Ted's Mm -hmm. and the band that he had not, of course, uh, pulled the trigger on um, was, was actually doing the title track. All of a sudden, then he wanted to sign us. He he goes, yeah, now I'm going to sign you guys to a a development deal officially and uh, on the condition that you, you cannot call this Nelson. I don't want the first thing that goes out to be, you know, with, with you guys to be on a rival label. You've got to change the name. So just on the fly, I came up with the name Power Tool. And so Power Tool is really Nelson before there was a Nelson. And, uh, and it's just me and Matthew and Dweezil Zappa. Wow. Okay. 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 Yeah. Wow. That's a cool story. That's well, awesome. it was also the first time I actually heard Extreme. Oh, Cause, okay. Because I'm sitting there in the screening. Uh, you know, it, and and I'm watching in the screening room the the first. I mean, I had no idea what the movie was going to be like, and I was expecting like just something incredibly lame. But it was actually awesome when I saw it. Right. An appropriate word. And I thought, you know what, this movie actually might might do something here. And and all of a sudden, this song came on, and it was "Play with Me" by Extreme. And I was like, Who the fuck is playing that guitar? <laughs> Who's yeah. that guy? You know, because I'd never heard guitar played like that before. Right. And, and it turned out to be Nuno Betancourt. And then, you know, over the years, we became really good friends with Paul Geary, their drummer, who's now a manager and uh, and stuff. And, you know, heard all my Nuno stories, which made me feel like quitting. He was like, yeah, well, you know, Nuno basically had been playing guitar for a year and a half when we put Extreme together. And he basically came out of the womb playing like that. And he's just one of those guys who's a savant. He just, you know, his hands go in a certain place in a certain way. He doesn't even have to think about it. He, he really didn't work on it. It was just kind of there. Mm-hmm. You know? um, but I, I met so many great friends on doing Bill and Ed's. And, and, uh, and, and again, it was really kind of the, the catalyst that really launched Nelson because without that leverage, without that excitement, I, I honestly don't know if Kalodner ever would have signed us, you know, to, to get there. Okay. Um, I also read that you, your band was the the only unsigned act to ever play SNL. How did that come about? And I mean, I couldn't find video of it anywhere. And you won't. And the reason was because we didn't have a record label. Oh, okay. Okay. And you won't. Um, you can find it. You have to go deep in, into okay. the internet. You can find it. I could probably send you a copy of it. It's actually really good. And, and what made it great is that um, it was the episode where Ronnie Reagan Jr. was huh. the host. 
Okay. And and Ronnie was a, a family friend. So okay. he kind of grew up with him. We showed up, and it's like, I mean, he remembers us when we were like eight years old. He's like, what are you guys doing here? What are you doing here? I'm hosting. <laughs> we're the musical guests. You know, um, we had a manager at the time, this guy named Kevin, and Kevin was really tight with Lauren Michaels. Mm-hmm. And we had been doing, we'd been building up and stuff and building some excitement from all our club work. And, uh, and we had gotten on a, a couple of national uh, morning shows, and, and so that whole thing was building, and we had that tape to be able to show Lorne. And, um, and the pitch was, you know, obviously you've got the, the family connection and all that kind of stuff, but these guys are really good. And, um, you know, I know you've never done an unsigned act, but, but w- what about it? And, and so uh, Mr. Michaels popped on the idea, and it was great. And that was, we were booked, I think, in October. And we were we were scheduled to actually do our actual uh, work in January, and then our father died in the plane crash on New Year's Eve, okay. and and we really had to make a decision whether or not we were going to follow through with that that appearance on SNL, because the world was completely upside down for us, and you know we didn't want people to think that that you know we were taking advantage of a tragedy to mm-hmm. go and do that, but that gig was booked six months before Pop died, mm-hmm. and uh, and we just decided to do it, but. I'm glad we did. We we played it well, and uh, and all that stuff. But it was actually on the plane ride home from playing on SNL, and that that star was was rising. That you know, I just had this this real feeling in my gut that it wasn't ready and it wasn't right, and we needed time to heal and we needed to retool. And that's when I decided to take a year off and go from being a, a drummer who sang to being a, a lead vocal singing guitar player. And, and that's what I did. And that's the difference between uh, the band The Nelsons, who played on SNL, and Nelson, who came out three years later, was, uh, was a complete retooling of everything. And, and really, playing on SNL was the catalyst for doing that. How difficult was that to learn the guitar in a year? Not. No? No, no, no. Look, think about this. Here's there is, this way my mind works. Because remember, on the other side of my family, I come from a bunch of sports guys. Okay, okay. My, my my grandpa Tom won the Heisman Trophy at Michigan in 1940. Um, my uncle Mark, who is now Gibbs on NCIS, was a starting quarterback at UCLA. So I grew up around sports as well, mm-hmm. and it's all about concentration of focus. Mm-hmm. And what was explained to me as a kid was like, uh, okay, think about it this way: um, if a guy has said, "I've been playing guitar for 10 years," all right, cool, yeah. respect. He probably has had the instrument in his hand, if he's lucky, on average, maybe a half hour a day for that 10 years. Maybe. Right. Okay. So, or, or an hour a day. So what I reasoned was, okay, Matt, what if I take an entire year off and all I do for that year is have the guitar in my hands for 12 hours a day, every single day for a year? I'll be playing just like that guy who says he's been playing for 10 years in a year. It's all about focus. And that's what I did. I, I went down to Guitar Center. Uh, you know, we didn't have the internet at the time, so I got a bunch of Starlix tapes of, of you know, players I loved. You know, mm-hmm. I, I got uh, I got Randy Rhodes, and I got George Lynch, and I got all these great rock guys that I I, I admired. And I, all I did was study, and I I really enjoyed playing guitar and learning guitar. But I taught myself how to do it. And about halfway through that year, put a little side band together thing to kind of rehearse myself up. And uh, a year later, we were at Cherokee Recording Studios, and I was playing all the guitar on the Nelson record. Wow. Very cool. But, but I had the blessing. Look, everybody, life happens. You know, people have jobs and kids and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I understand why most people aren't able to do that. For me, you know, our father had just died, and there was nothing going on. And it was like, look, I, I need a, a year to grieve anyways. But what a great catharsis for me to, to be yeah. able to, to – do that to take my mind off of my grief and so really at that point I mean music had always been my salvation through a you know an alcoholic abusive mother and and all that Mm -hmm. stuff music was really kind of like our our life preserver Um, but it was also there for me that year after pop died too in that way what's the best piece of advice your father ever gave you oh I I would have to quote Nelson's rule of three okay? okay which still holds true to this day we've got three principles that we live by okay um, the first is be undeniably good. Now, that can come to mean a bunch of different things. You can use that in a lot of different contexts. Be undeniably good. Number two, always keep your sense of humor. 
because in this business, you're going to need it. And that's true. Okay. Don't take yourself too seriously. And third, don't be a dick. That's okay. it. If you remember those three, honestly, life is grand. And if you, if you go off the rails, it's because you've forgotten one of those things. You're taking yourself too seriously or you've lost your sense of humor or, you know, you're just phoning it in and, and going for average rather than excellent, you know, or your attitude's gotten away from you. And uh, those have really kind of been the true north in my compass. And I also remember what Grandma Harriet said, which she said, boys, if you're going to get into this business, I want you to remember this. The Nelson family has never been in the entertainment business. We've been in the connection business. That's what we do. So just make sure whatever you do, you pr approach it that way, and you always make sure that the human element is there, and you're always connected with the people you're making music for. And and between my dad and my grandma, you know, honestly, the foundation was pretty firm. Mm -hmm. You know, being around the music business and in the music business as long as you have, are you surprised to see where it has gone, where it is today with, you know, social media and a lot of, you know, the albums not even being that big of a deal anymore well you know i mean think when music really started first off the music industry was founded by war profiteers after world war ii mm -hmm. okay these were black marketeers uh who basically just were really good at exploiting mm -hmm. and so that that was what was really founded when 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 music really started when popular music really started uh it was really all about singles anyways you know people right. were selling singles out of the trunks of their cars you know, mm -hmm. now what's what's changed obviously is the distribution. The only drag is every dickhead with a copy of Garage Band thinks he's a producer. Right. You know, so you know uh, if everybody's special, no one is. But I think what it really comes down to is two things that that we're challenged by. Like when we started out making music, we would give away the live shows in order to sell the records. It's reversed. Right. The the records are really commercial to get people to your live show. So as long as you embrace that, that's pretty cool. Because the one thing that, you know, th there really is no substitute in my opinion, and I only know because I get to be the guy on stage looking out at crowds, mm -hmm. is that, man, there's just a rush. There's an energy. Everybody during COVID tried to do virtual concerts. It never connected because it was, by its nature, disconnected. Yeah. You know, there's something about the inconvenience of going to a concert and drinking out of a red solo cup and peeing behind a bush and <laughs> being uncomfortable that, that, that gives you that – experience right and yeah. and and and, and I, I don't think that's ever hopefully it's ever going to go away um but I, I also think there are two ways that you can actually really approach uh, music in general it's unfortunate that the powers that be sucked all the money out of what i do for a living and they did that with napster and and uh, and all of that you know decades yeah. ago um when something becomes free to generations who know no different Mm -hmm. Free denotes it's not valuable. It has no value. And we put a lot of work into making this music. Now there are a lot of people out there that don't put a lot of work into making music and there are a lot of there are a lot of them on the internet right now. You know, right. they cut and paste. It's basically, you know, they're grabbing from this and grabbing from that and doing all that and stuff and doing that in their DAW and you know, all of a sudden they're a producer or they're an artist or doing whatever. You know, all I know is, you know, I come from the sensibility of of writing a, a line in a song, don't be afraid to lose what was never meant to be. And I still get letters from people going, hey, man, you were really there for me at a time in my life when I really needed to hear that one lyric. I really needed that. It, it, it changed my life for the better. And that's why I'm doing what I do. I'm not doing it for likes. I'm not doing it for followers. Uh, I'm not doing it for OnlyFan money. You're never going to see pictures of my feet on the Internet. <laughs> I, I, I'm doing this because I genuinely love music. Mm -hmm. I came out of the womb genuinely loving music. Look, I, brother, I could do affiliate marketing and make far more money, far, far more money than doing the the music that I make. You know, this is not about. I mean, we come from an era when you're playing the LA clubs and you're paying Esther Wong to, Wong to play because you're paying for the parking, and she's right. taking the money you were supposed to make down to. Hollywood Park and blown it on the horses. You know, right. that's what I that's what I grew up doing and you know, it never dissuades you. And, you know, I think every musician who's really in it for the right reasons knows that man, it, it really is it's a it's a journey. It's not a destination. And mm -hmm. and you're constantly reinventing yourself and and you have your downtimes and stuff and then you meet that one fan who tell who shares a story with you that it just 
that just changes you, you know? Mm-hmm. Right, um, absolutely. And, and so here we are all these years later, and, you know, again, I, I kept my word. I would, not, I would not go out with Nelson unless I could do it the right way, the way it deserved. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it, it, it came out of the box guilty until proven innocent. We had to overcompensate by making the music that much better than most of the stuff that was out there, the videos that much more exciting than the other ones that people were making because we were guilty until proven innocent. We had to create our own category. And mm-hmm. to me, that was really special. And I didn't want to do anything that, that wasn't special, you know? Right, right, absolutely. Last question for you. Um, Thursday night at the Diamond Music Hall, um, what can fans expect from the show on Thursday? A complete escape from this crappy world that we're living in right now. Right. Okay. I mean, we are living in really freaking bizarre times. Every time I wake up in the morning, I'm like, what did, what did the guys do now? What am I waking up to now? Yeah. And nothing would shock me. But what, the, what people can rely on at a Nelson concert is a total escape into uh, a time and a place when they felt 10 feet tall and bulletproof, their entire lives were ahead of them, the world was full of possibilities, and they were not getting browbeaten by death and depression and angst and Karen's and Darren's. Okay, it is a complete 180 degree turn from all of that stuff. It is worth getting a sitter for. It is worth spending the time to come down and do it because uh, we take it very, very seriously, and that's what we're going to deliver. Baby, I can't live without your love and affection.